I've been fishing in one form or another since 2008 from the deck of our boat sailing yacht Esper. I'm no expert, but this is what I've learned. Something on the end of the line. It's either a fish pulling or a bag that's dragging under. We'll or, find out. Or a nappy. Or a nappy. Or that banana skin I just threw over. <laughs> Why should cruisers learn to fish? To eat, of course. Yep, cruisers need to eat, and what do we like more than anything else? We like free stuff, so if you catch a fish, you can feed yourself and your crew for a day, or maybe if you catch a nice big one, for a week. The other reason for fishing on a cruising boat is that when you get those great long stretches, you need something to do, especially if you're crossing an ocean or doing a very long passage up a coast. Stick a line out, play with it, have some focus, it's something to do. I started fishing because we had a cat called Millie and she loved eating fish. So in Turkey I learned the very basics of how to put a fish trap down and catch little tiddlers and then I got a little bit more brave and I got a little fishing rod and tried fishing off the side, doing some hand trolling, caught one or two. She loved them and because of her absolute joy in fishing I decided I really needed to learn how to do this properly. We sailed across the Mediterranean from Turkey to Egypt and I stuck a trolling line out the back all the way. I caught a tuna, it was my very first tuna. It was the most exciting thing, apart from sailing, that I'd ever done up until that point. It's all about the passion. I believe firmly that if you are passionate about fishing, you're gonna have more luck. There is no point, absolutely no point, in throwing a line out and hoping that a fish will impale itself on your hook. You need to be actively fishing. You're watching that line all the time. You're watching the sea and watching the conditions. You're making sure that you're going towards where there might be fish. You're checking the lure. Is it working? Keep looking, keep looking out the back. Is that, is that lure working? Bring it in, tug it, just check it. Can you feel the action of the lure? I often find actually if I bring a line in to change the lure that I'll get a strike. All the gear and no idea. Yep that was us when we started out. We had a rod and a reel that was suggested to us by a friend of Jamie's who is a really keen fisherman. He lives for fishing. I used as my first piece of instruction this book, The Cruiser's Handbook of Fishing. When I started to read it it was literal gobbledygook. I didn't know what they were talking about. It's only as I've got a little bit better at fishing and understanding everything that I realise now how brilliant it is. Of course now we've got YouTube so there are millions of YouTube videos about fishing. And the other major thing that's been of a help to me has been the fishing gurus that we've met along the way. I've met some really good fishermen, fisher people who um, have, have given me a few tips and I'm going to give you my top three tips at the end of the video. The best piece of advice I can offer, have a go. Get your rig, get the equipment, get whatever you think's right for you and your boat, throw it out there and have a go. The first time you catch something will be the most exciting moment in your fishing life and hopefully it will ignite that passion. <laughs> The first rig and the most common rig you'll find on any sailing boat is a hand line. This is a hand line. That's the line. That's the yo-yo. They come in all different kinds of shapes and sizes. This is the, one of my more favourite ones. It's very simple and you can understand why people will use them on a sailing boat. They don't take up much room, that's it. So storage wise, really easy. You can just keep it in the cockpit all ready to go and you can have two or three of these. I'll talk you through basically how I set mine up. Very simple. First of all you need something to connect it to the boat and that's got to be really strong piece of line and that's got to be connected to the boat so if all goes wrong, all goes tits up, you don't lose it over the edge. You really don't want to do that. So I just connect it through. This has got holes in it. Most of them have some kind of hole. If not, if you, some of the wooden ones you can drill a hole in. So that's quite separate. That's a separate piece altogether. So you start off with a piece of line like this very securely attached inside, it cannot come off, it's nice and tight so if you get to the very end, which you will do, it's nice and tight, can't slip off either side. So you've got that in there. Next, you need to attach that to the monofilament and that is your main fishing line that's going to go out to your lure. 
You decide how long you want that to be. There is no right or wrong answer. Once you've made the decision how long it's going to be, that is the length of the trolling line. They say a boat and a half length or two boat length is average, but some people I know go a lot longer than that. Some people even go a little shorter. Our boat's 13 metres, I have about 20, 25 metres. So in order to get a little bit of stretch, into this finite line. Between here and the monofilament, you need to use something like um, an old bicycle tube, inner tube, so that when the strike happens, there's a, a little bit of a give. And so what I also do is from the original line to the monofilament, in addition to the bungee, I attach another piece of safety line so that if the bungee were to break, you don't lose the whole thing. Clear as mud. There are loads of videos about it. I'll try and link to some of the ones that I like below, but if not, obviously, look in the book. It shows you in detail how to do it. Then you have to wind on 20, 30 metres of monofilament, whatever that may be. Then you're at the business end. Business end is your lure. Some people like to use uh, steel trace because they're worried about the, uh, the fish biting through your very flimsy monofilament. I've never had that happen, it's never bitten through. I'm not fishing for huge fish, I'm not fishing for marlin or anything really big. Okay, so now we're on our way. Got the line out, going out, going out, gonna get a fish, gonna get a tuna for supper. Tuna do have teeth and so do mackerel, but I've never had a problem with them biting through it. So I don't bother with um, any kind of steel uh, trace at the end. I'll just use more filament, monofilament, uh, something with a bit of stretch in it. And in fact, on here, I don't think I even put anything in between. I just used good stretchy monofilament the whole way through. Yeah, I did. And then, and at the end, I've got this lure, which is, anyone knows anything about them? It's a rappeler. It's a red and white rappeler, reckoned by most people to be the most successful rappeler of all of their lures. So I've just attached this directly to the ring. Rigging a rod and reel. We got rid of Jamie's old fishing rod because it just rusted away to nothing. And I'd been using a yo-yo for years and decided that I really needed to get another step up. And it was someone who'd followed us and supported us for some time who said, Liz, I'm fed up with watching you use a bloody hand line. Get yourself a rod and reel. Here's 50 quid towards it. So thank you very much. I went out and under instruction, got a rod and reel. And this is what I got. It's a pen and it's on a pen rod. Specifically for trolling, you hold it this way up through the guides and out the end. Mine, you may have noticed, is left-handed. It's not because I'm left-handed, it's because it's the only one they had uh, at the Lankawi fishing shop. It's not like a rod you would use for casting. It's a trolling rod, so it's short, quite stiff, but it has got some bend because you, if you get the right fish, you will get some, a nice bend in it. And then you've got the reel attached here. It's a little bit wobbly, so to be honest with you, I could do with tightening that up. There you go. I have very strong braid attached to the reel um, as the majority of it. And then the braid goes uh, from braid to monofilament. And then that goes directly to the lure. So how do I connect all of these things? I don't use any mechanical connectors. I do it all with knots. You might wonder how you connect braid to monofilament without using any kind of mechanical connector. Well, I discovered that the best thing to do is an FG knot. I'll link below to one of the videos that I use to do the FG knot, but it is magical. You take the braid, you take the monofilament, and you almost sort of weave it round itself and pull it back, and then you've got one long line that's perfectly connected, nothing in between. So the really marvellous thing about connecting your braid to your monofilament with just a simple woven knot is it will go through the level wind. It'll go right through here, straight onto your, onto your drum. You can pull the fish right in. You can even put it right up to the end if you want to. Here's the end of the pen. Here are all the guides. And through the top here, Simply linked with a knot. This is a uni knot. This is the knot I use for everything apart from the FG knot. Master it and then you're done. The uni knot attaches directly onto the ring and onto the lure. Again, it's a rappel lure. I've had some good strikes and some good hits with this. My latest one was an enormous mackerel that fed us for a week. So yeah, this is great. It's not, it's not uh, red and white, is it? 
but it's a good one. Very recently, I splashed out and bought myself a second rod and reel uh, as a little birthday present to myself because up until now I've been using the rod and reel on one side and the yo-yo on the other side. Occasionally I've even had a yo-yo at the back, I've had three things out, I'll talk about that in a minute. I wanted to have two reels, why? Because I just did. <laughs> I looked all over the net and I, in fact what happened was that I was looking at fishing videos, I was looking at connectors and rig setups and so forth and I found this channel and I just loved him, I loved what he was talking about and I copied everything that he said. Just a quick word on connectors, as you can see I don't really like using them, I try to use knots wherever I can. This is because a guru, uh, I can't remember his name, but he's a fishing champion and he's used around the world to endorse products. I met him once, sat on the back of his boat. He said the biggest mistake that most newbies make is using far too big and bulky connectors and far too many of them. If you can, reduce your connectors to the smallest possible size and if you can, use a knot. Not always easy to do that, and yes, there are times when you're going to need connectors. So which connectors to use? I don't know. There's no right or wrong. There really isn't any right or wrong. To be honest, over the years, I've got boxes and boxes and boxes. I have gone back to things that I had a few years ago that are still okay. So keep them nice and clean and in, in, in boxes and uh, yeah, develop a nice little workspace full of all your fishing gear. It's great fun. <laughs> quick word on lures. I'm not talking about casting or anything like that. I'm just talking about trolling in this video. And you've got various options. You've got spoons, squids, plugs. They all have slightly different job. I tend to use rappelers, as you've already seen, or some kind of plug. It doesn't have to be a rappeler. They are quite expensive, but they are my favourite. You can get uh, cheaper versions and you can get other makes and other brands. So basically, the rappeler plug has been technically de designed so that it looks like a fish swimming in distress and they are great for sailing boats and the reason for that is is because they work well at slow speeds so five knots and below it's not too fast for it to lose the motion but it's fast enough I mean I've caught things at two and a half knots using these fast enough to give it the motion to look like a fish and yeah brilliant so we don't often go over five knots they're mostly deep, they run deep, but you can get them you can get them to run on the surface as well. So look for the different types that there are out there. And if you're gonna have more than one rig, have one high and one low. Why not? Makes sense, doesn't it? The other big one, of course, is squids. People use squids a lot. They tend to work better when you're going a bit faster because they will present a lot of frenetic activity underwater with, with stuff flying around all over the place. Maybe the, some of them even have uh, air coming out of them and noises and rattles. But they only really work when you're going fast and you're, you're looking for a, a big fish that's going to do a quick strike. So I have got them. Uh, here's a bucket load of squids. Try a squid, but you need to be doing well over six knots, I think, personally, for a squid to work. And that's my piece of advice. And then there are spoons. A friend of ours in Turkey, he used spoons and I don't have one to hand, that's because I don't really use them. He used to fish in Turkey in the Met and he used to catch fish all the time. And a spoon tends to be a long piece of metal, usually banged shaped kind of metal. It might have something hanging off the back of it and it will catch the light and it will move in the water. It spins so you'll need a swivel on it like a squid. Um, S similar sort of thing as a squid, but they can work really, really well for trolling. I think they might be okay at slower speeds, but I've never had any luck with them. So the main piece of advice I'd say about lures is to have quite a few. When you start out, you're going to be losing them as well, I'm afraid, probably, particularly if you're on a hand line and if you haven't quite got your knots right. <laughs> so have a few. Um, have some really good ones and have some cheaper ones that you might be able to, that you might lose and not cry about. Keep changing your lure if nothing's happening. If you've been out for an hour and you're trolling along and you're trolling along and there's not been a single flicker of a bite or any kind of action, change it. Change the type. It might be a floater, change it to a deep one, change the colour, change the length. 
spend a lot of time playing around and changing your lures if they're not working. False alarm? Yeah, I think it's a false alarm. Yeah. But I'll bring it in and set it again. Another word on lures and rigs, for that matter, is how many lines you're going to put out. I tend to use one line, and if we're going on a longish passage without many tacks, I'll use two lines. The problem with sailing is that when you're tacking a lot and moving the boat around, you can end up with your lines crossed. And when that happens, you end up oh, spending hours untangling the lines on the boat as you're moving and then throwing them out again. So one line is usually fine. If the conditions are really good, I actually put three out. So I'll have one either side out and I'll also put one in the middle. That will be a hand line, a yo-yo of some kind. And that'll have a teaser on it. And a teaser is something that sits on the top of the water and splashes about 10 metres out and it gets a lot of excitement. It gets the excitement, it, get, it gets fish to notice that there's something going on over there. So a teasers are quite good. This is what I use. They're really just about trying to uh, get them interested, but you can actually catch things with teasers. Put it in the middle, might work. One last thing, you can make your own lures. You don't have to spend all this money on them. I know a friend of mine who used to catch fish using an old toothpaste tube that he just cut up so that it had sort of feathery bits at the end, put a um, hook through it, and he used to have quite good success that way. So you can make your own lures. It's not something I've done yet because I have a feeling if I were to start doing that, I'd never stop. So if the unthinkable happens, and you've got something at the end of the line, and believe me, you'll know you've got something. Sometimes you can feel the line doing that, but when you've got a strike, it'll go bang, you'll really hear it. And if you've set up your line and your reel properly, you'll have a ticker on there. So as the strike happens, there'll be an enormous screaming noise as the ticker goes off and the line gets taken out. Tighten up your line, start reeling it in. You get it up to the boat. Now, how are you going to get it on the boat? That is another time when people do tend to lose their fish. If you don't keep that line really nice and high and keep that fish up, it will get off. And it's happened to me and it will happen to you, I'm sure, if it hasn't already. Try and get the fish up to the boat as quickly as you can and out of the water even quicker. Liz catches, Jamie dispatches. So I get them as close to the boat as I can. And that's where having those knots on your line, which allows you to bring the fish right up close, really helps Jamie. He hasn't got to bring in the last bit of the line by hand because it won't go through. Um, it's right up to the boat. He then leans over, gaffs it. This is a gaff. Got a nasty point on it. Gaffs the fish, brings it up onto the boat, and then we're ready to finish it off. The other thing to remember is if you have a fish on the end of the line is slow the boat down. If you're going really fast and you catch a fish on the end of the line, um, it's going to pull the fish off, uh, particularly if it's, uh, it's a hand line, I'm afraid, because there isn't enough give in it. At least with a rod and reel, you can, let the, you, can, you can pay it out a bit and you can allow the fish, you can allow it to stretch, you can allow it to move. While the skipper is bringing the boat speed down, you can pay it out and bring it in, pay it out, keeping, obviously, keeping it nice and tight the whole time, but it just gives you a little bit more of a chance of keeping hold of that fish at uh, fast speeds. Sometimes Jamie's busy filming me and he hasn't got the gaff ready and I get cross. <laughs> And in that case, I will bring the fish up over the guardrail. It tends to be with the smaller fish, but I've now learned how to do it very quickly. I can pull them and swing them uh, and get them onto, onto the deck. There will be balls ups. You will get all kinds of problems when you start. And as you continue to fish, I am still ballsing up quite a lot of the time. Oh, fuck. Well, this has come off. you got to say, is it worth it? I mean, this... I've got a hook caught in the rope here, right through the middle. He got off! Boom! Back out. Back out we go. Gut, cook, eat, yes. This is the whole reason why you fish. 
is to eat it. So first of all, you need to learn how to gut a fish. That's Jamie's job on our boat. If you don't know how to do it, again, YouTube is your friend. Loads and loads of videos on how to do it and books. And talking of books, if you are a cruiser, if you live on your boat and you're gonna do some fishing, get this book, The Cruising Chef Cookbook. It's by Michael Greenwald, it's ancient. But as you can see, I've used it a lot and it has loads and loads of tips, including a lot on fish, on gutting them, on preparing them and what you can do with them. We tend to catch mackerel. That's what we catch most of the time. Sometimes we get tuna and then we do tuna steaks. Um, we haven't caught a Dorado or Mai Mai for about 10 years. It's one of our favorite fish. Just don't seem to get them around here or at least my line doesn't catch them. <laughs> wow. Beautiful, beautiful mackerel. Our favorite fish. I know you want to fish. I want to fish all the time. It's the, it's the excitement of the strike and bringing fish on board. But don't, just, just eat what you've got and then fish the next time. We need to look after our oceans. And on that note, if you catch a bluefin tuna, they're worth a bomb and they're very rare. And therefore, they really need protecting. So bluefins, if you're lucky enough to catch one, prize it, love it, kiss it, photograph it, but push it back in the water. It's going back in. Is, the, is it the biggest fish we've ever caught? It is pretty fucking big. I hope this long rambling video about my experiences of fishing on our sailboat has been of interest to you. Maybe you've learned something and maybe you can teach me something. If you can, put it in the comments below. Share your experiences. I love reading them, particularly about fishing. And finally, those three top tips that I promised earlier on. Number one, you're not going to be surprised about is connections. Keep them small and preferably just use knots. Try and do away with the swivels and all the other bits and bobs. Learn your knots, particularly the uni knot, and connect just with knots. You want to streamline the whole thing as much as you possibly can. Number two, go where the fish are. First of all, when you're ocean cruising, so in blue water, we all know to look for the fish that are bait balling and to look for the diving birds because we know there's going to be some activity around there. But maybe what you don't know is that you shouldn't go straight for it. You should go around the outside. This is a tip given to us by a friend of ours who learned his skills as a fisherman from the age of 14 on the trawlers in Hull. He said, don't go straight at the bait ball, go around the outside, you're going to be much more likely to pick up some of the guys that are coming in to get the fish. Most of the time we are coastal cruising and the most useful thing there is going to be your charts, which you're looking at anyway. You want to look for shoals, for ridges, for contour lines where it suddenly gets a bit shallower. Obviously in, in coral and rocky areas, you can have a much better opportunity to catch fish there around headlands because that's the sort of place that they congregate. So when you're planning your cruise, try and take in some of those places along the way. Tip number three, get one of these. It's a fisherman's friend. Very basic, like, like pliers. It's got the grippy bits. It's got the nice little knife bit in the middle there, but most important of all, it's got this hook. And that's really good for using those horrible split pins, getting your loops on and off the split pins, because if they're really good, they're very difficult to open up. And the most important thing of all that this is useful for is getting the hook out of the fish when you've caught it. Cheers. There's no fish activity except on the end of my line. <laughs> yes, definitely felt the bite. Just happened to be holding the line as, I, as it bit. Let's see what we've got. I guess I should slow the boat down. 